Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Parosh webinar on chemical research, the findings on chemical research from our members. My name is uh, Jan Michiel Meusen from uh, Parosh, and next to me is uh, Joyce Lufting, also from the Parosh communication team and dissemination team. Before we start with our three uh, esteemed speakers, I will explain you a bit about the background of these sort of webinars and our house rules, how we will operate. First of all, um, most of you probably were subscribed to the newsletter of Parosh, newsletter and events, and then you receive a newsletter based on specific uh, thematic uh, themes, themes, so to say, and chemical research was the last one. And then we make a choice of speakers from those contributions to the uh, newsletter and we invite them to present their findings in a webinar. So three of the uh, contributors of the newsletter are now in our webinar and they will explain a bit more about their contribution, their article for the newsletter. So this is how we work. Um, each speaker will have 15 minutes um, and then the participants, you as participants, you can ask questions, you can post questions and Joyce will explain what is the procedure on how you can post questions. Thank you. Welcome everybody. Um, as introduced by uh, Jan Michiel, indeed you can ask your questions using the Q&As uh, in the chat box um, in Teams. Um, I will look through them and um, share them to our presenters uh, if applicable right now. If you have additional questions, uh, you can always share them later with the presenters. So please feel free to ask your questions and uh, I will read through them. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, this uh, webinar will also be recorded, so we will produce a video of it. So you can always later in our YouTube tube feed, if you uh, subscribe to the YouTube feed, you can uh, watch the video of this uh, webinar. And we will also post this on our website. If you visit our website, I would really love to invite you to visit the website later on. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't done so to our newsletter and events and this is one of the events that we are organizing and have a look at our repository uh, where we have a whole collection of articles reports on studies and research that was produced by the members of Parosh, the partnership on european research in occupational safety and health in europe now a brief introduction of the three speakers we have um, someone from France, Yves uh, Bourgard, uh, someone from Germany, Rolf Pakarov, and from Norway, Steen Mollerup, all working um, at our member institutes in these countries. Um, they will present some of their uh, uh, research findings. Uh, there will be also one presentation on a huge project where um, STAMI, in this case the Norwegian Institute, but also other institutes are participating in Europe and um, yeah they are uh, eager to share their findings and I, we will start now with Yves Bourgard. Yves is an epidemiologist in occupational health at the French Research and Safety Institute INRS in France. She has been working in the Department of Occupational Epidemiology for 25 years and her main research topics are chemical risks from metalworking fluids to mycotoxins, night work, and the, this, the consequences this has on your health, on workers' health. The title of her presentation is Exposure to Metalworking Fluids and Markers of Early Health Effect Among Metal Industry Workers. So Eve, I hope you are ready and able. Uh, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you, thank you. I'm sharing uh, my presentation. Um, yes. yes, do you okay. see it? It's yeah. okay. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to present uh, the, the results of a study conducted at INRS in partnership with Unisante, located in Lausanne, Switzerland, and with the University of Lille in France. Um, I'm going to share the, the first results of this study. 
So metal working fluids, also known as MWF, are used to lubricate and cool tools and the workpieces and to remove metals particles in industrial machining in, of metals in many manufacturing processes. Metal working fluids are classified into two main families, straight, uh, straight MWF, that is mineral or synthetic oil containing no water, and aqueous MWF, that regroups soluble oils and semi-synthetic fluids according to the amount of mineral oils, as well as synthetic fluids that contain no mineral oils. Depending on their use and type, metal working fluids may contain different types of additives. Moreover, in use, the fluids could be contaminated with substances from the manufacturing process or with substances that are the result of a thermal degradation such as pH or, or with metals uh, or with microorganisms that may be growing in tanks. Thus, the physical process of metal working generates a, com uh, generate a, a complex aerosol consisting of solid particles and droplets in suspension in a vapor phase. So this aerosol can reach the worker's breathing zone and may remain in suspension for several hours. Historically, Exposure to poorly refined straight oil has been related to cancer of the skin. As early as the 1990s, exposure to oil mist was also related to hypersensitivities, pneumonitis, asthma, and respiratory symptoms. Direct contact with MWF could cause contact dermatitis, also called eczema. Metal working fluids are complex mixture um, and uh, that are constantly changing. So we wanted to set up an epidemiological study that could answer the question, is there a relationship between current exposure and a health effect? Since we are studying a current exposure, we could not wait for a potential appearance of disease for us, it was important to be able to anticipate clinical effects by measuring biomarkers of early effects. So, what is a biomarker? Is a biological indicator measurable in the body, uh, for instance, in blood or urine? An early uh, effect biomarkers allows the identification of biological alteration before the possible appearance of symptoms or disease. And they are most often reversible thanks to the body's regulatory mechanisms and do not systematically lead to a disease. Thus, to define uh, these early effect markers, we relied on this presumed physiopathological mechanism showing the harmful, the harmful effects of particles at the cellular level through oxidative stress. So briefly, the exposure to an aerosol generates free radicals in the lungs and thereby causes oxidative stress. This oxidative stress is important, is an important mechanism leading to inflammation. Thus, this chronic inflammation could eventually lead to chronic adverse health effects such as airway disease or cancer. The objective of our epidemiological study is to analyze, analyze the possible relationships between occupational exposure to metal working fluids and early effects on health by measuring biomarkers on early non-specific effect at the respiratory level. Its purpose, the atmospheric exposure um, uh, of the respirable um, aerosol was evaluated. Three biomarkers of effects uh, of uh, oxidative stress were studied. 
They are the products of oxidative reactions taking place at the cell level. And one biomarkers of inflammation was evaluated. The genotoxicity of the aerosol was evaluated by screening for abnormalities in cell nuclei. The presence of a special type in buccal, buccal cells is considering a sign of damage to the DNA and of chromosomal instability. Respiratory symptoms were also studied. An epidemiological study among exposed versus non-exposed workers to metal working fruits was conducted in French and Swiss companies. The data collection took place during two working days. The occupational exposure was described by measuring the mass fraction of the respirable fract uh, particulate MWF using a reference gravimetric method. The overall airborne MWF was also evaluated. It consists of the sum of the particulate fraction of MWF and the volatile organic fraction that was sampled using a serbent tube. The health effects were measured at the respiratory level. The oxidative, the biomarkers of oxidative stress were measured in Excel breath, breath condensate. This one corresponds to the exhalate of a breath that has been cooled using a collective device. It reflects changes, uh, it reflects changes in the respiratory fluid lining the, the airways. The airways. The volunteer had to breathe for 20 minutes in the collective device. The measure of the respiratory inflammation in the exhaled air was realized using a standardized commercial device. Abnormalities in nuclear of cell were investigated in cells of oral mucosa. These were collected using a cito brush on inner cheeks of the volunteer's mouth. Respiratory symptoms were explored using a standardized questionnaire. The data collection took place in companies for one year and a half. 120 workers were included in the study, 86 uh, exposed and 34 non-exposed to metal working fruits. Uh, they were 39 years old on average, 27% uh, were women and 32% were smokers. 15 companies participated in the study. Uh, the nine French um, companies produced automotive and aeronautical parts, cutting tools, selling collars and cylindrical bars and tubes using mainly aqueous metal working fluids. And the six Swiss um, companies produced watchmaking and medical parts and electrical contactors using only straight metal working fluids. Here are the results of the atmospheric measures carried out in companies. For particulate fraction, 10% of the concentration exceed the French recommended value. On the graph below are reported the median and the interquartile range of particulate fraction concentrations in the non-exposed group in blue, in the group of workers exposed to aqueous metalworking fluid in orange, and in the group of workers exposed to straight metalworking fluid in, uh, in gray. We observed slightly a higher concentration in the exposed group um, regardless of exposure, compared to the non-exposed group. In contrast, uh, the concentration of overall airborne uh, metal working fruits were much higher in the exposed group uh, than in the non-exposed group, with higher concentrations in the atmosphere of workers using straight metal working fluids. Here are the results concerning the association between exposure and early health effects. 
concerning particulate fraction. Uh, in this study, we observed a relationship statistically significant between the increase of particulate fraction exposure and an increase in one of the three biomarkers of oxidative stress. The two others could not be studied because their concentration were below the limit of quantification. We observed no relationship with the respiratory inflammation mar marker. However, an association statistically significant was observed uh, with the frequency of several types of cell nuclear abnormalities. For the respi respiratory symptoms, the frequency of asthma-like symptoms and cough and expectoration increased statistically with exposure. Uh, concerning both particulate and volatile uh, fractions, we observed a similar results that were more pronounced for oxidative stress and uh, general toxicity. And uh, the frequency of the three types of symptoms increased significantly with exposure. So, in conclusion, there's uh, results are in favor of an association between exposure to metal working fluids and the current at the current job and early effects at the respiratory uh, level such as oxidative stress and genotoxicity and prevalence of respiratory symptoms this association are more often marked when considering the overall airborne metal working fluid the sum of the particulate and uh, and the volatile fractions. And the volatile fraction seems to be an important element to, to control. But until now, the preventive measures applied in French companies have only considered the whole miss problem from the particulate aspect. And we need to measure the, the, this volatile fraction in a reliable way to confirm the result of the study and to propose adequate preventive action if the results are confirmed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eve, for your uh, presentation. Uh, it's really clear, nice study, uh, both in Switzerland uh, and in, in France. Um, I have a question, one or two questions to you. Um, uh, one is, first of all, what is the size of this problem? Um, you, you did the research in a couple of companies in France, in, in, in Switzerland. Uh, if, if we are talking about a metalworking industry, and uh, you were talking about uh, for, uh, watches uh, that were constructed or uh, repaired, uh, is this a substantial sector where workers are exposed to these sort of metalworking fluids? Yes, yes. You can find different different type of uh, companies. There are companies where the workers are not very exposed to this, this uh, metalworking uh, uh, fluids uh, because you've got a lot of preventive uh, measures done. But you can find industries, companies where there were no um, preventive measure taken and uh, where the, the workers is uh, really exposed uh, yes uh, with um, through inhalation respiratory system or uh, cutaneous uh, uh, also yeah yes we, we find this and the situation in this study is that um, we um, uh, the preventive uh, measures are based on the, this particulate fraction. And this uh, study seems to, to show that um, perhaps the volatile fraction is an important point to study. Um, and uh, we uh, understand that um, for this type of aerosol, during the sampling, uh, there can be an instability of the two fraction. One can contaminate the other, for instance, uh, there can be an evaporation of the particulate fraction towards the volatile fraction. And the particulate fraction can be underestimated and the volatile fraction overestimated. So um, 
at the moment, um, a device is being developed in, uh, at INRS to measure the particulate and volatile fraction uh, separately and to have a, a good estimation of this concentration of uh, the two fractions. But um, the specialist is Say, said, says that it seems to be very complex to develop and uh, probably this would make it possible after that to estimate a reliable concentration of the volatile fraction and to study it uh, uh, specifically yep. to have, oh yes, specifically, yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, excellent. Uh, thank you very much for this answer and I think this is all, this was also part of the information sharing workshop we had at Parosh on metalworking fluids, where also Garrett Evans from uh, the UK was active and some others. Yeah. Am I right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. Yes, okay, excellent. Yes, yeah. we should. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, your your group, think, I think they convened for two times or three times last year, specifically on metalworking fluids. Yes, yes. Yes, I think they were emitting, emitting uh, before the... the yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I think one uh, one team uh, last year, or oh, this year, sorry, I don't remember no. <laughs> times. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, but just to show you, thanks a lot, Eve, for your contribution again, uh, just to show that um, this is uh, typically the sort of joint collaboration we have in Parosh. Did we have any questions yet? Uh, not yet. Not yet? No. Okay. But if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask them via the Q&A yeah. and we will come back to that later. Yeah. Yeah. If you can still post questions uh, during the webinar and then uh, we will try to answer them later on. Okay. We will go to our next speaker. There is one question. Okay. We will uh, answer this question later on. We will go to our next speaker. And before that, I would like to welcome so many participants we have across the globe. We had 130 registrations and we have almost 50 participants at the moment. Some from Europe, of course, several countries, but we also have participants from Turkey, from, particip from uh, Pakistan and from Japan. Uh, I think th this would be middle in the night in Japan, uh, probably if they uh, are attending. But anyway, if you are attending, welcome to our Parish webinar. It's great that you can join us. Okay, our next speaker will be Rolf Pakrov from the BAWA, which is the Bundesanstalt für Arbeitsschutz, if I pronounce it correctly in uh, Germany, which is the federal agency uh, connected to the federal ministry in Germany. And he will give a contribution on OSH when it comes to safe and sustainable design. Rolf, maybe you can introduce yourself a bit to the participants and then the floor is yours. We are curious to hear your presentation. Okay. Uh, hello and welcome everyone and thank you for the invitation. Uh, and now I'm sharing my screen. Uh, you hopefully you see it. Uh, yeah, I'm working as a scientific director in the Bauer department has a substance of biological agents and Bauer is the Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health uh, in Germany uh, and we have as an institute two interesting roles, two important roles with regard to chemical safety. On the one hand, under, under our roof, we have the Federal Chemicals Agency that is a competent authorities for REACH and CLP and Biocide Sites Regulation in Germany, which is a direct channel to the ECA in Helsinki. And on the other hand, uh, in our department four, we are working uh, on chemicals and biological agents with regard to chemical safety. So, so what we do is we can give impulses with our research to uh, to safe to use chemicals and products directed to those who produce and put chemicals on the market materials too. Uh, and on the other hand, we can influence fair and human working conditions uh, with uh, our uh, policy advice for uh, OSH regulation and technical rules and so on. Uh, so one 
framework for our current research and development is the uh, chemical strategy for sustainability of the European Union and looking at those com very complex uh, um, um, strategy, uh, you find innovating for safe and sustainable EU chemicals and for, uh, this is directly uh, addressed to research and development. On the one hand, to those who develop chemicals and materials, on the other hand, who make risk research and uh, make uh, develop strategies to uh, assess risk in an early stage of innovation and development. So let us have a, a look at innovating for safe and sustainable chemicals in the European Union. And there's a, in everyone's mouth currently, uh, safe and sustainable by design. It's part of PARC. I, we will hear from it in the next presentation, I think. Uh, and, and looking at safe and sustainable by design, we see that safe means safe at workplaces, safe to use and safe for the environment or environmentally friendly. That means no unacceptable risk for humans and the, and the environment over the entire life cycle. That's, that's very important. Uh, the second is sustainable. That means no ex unacceptable consequences for nature and future generations. And this should be implemented into an early stage of innovation. And the idea of safe and sustainable by design is not to have a regulation on safe and sustainable by design, but to have, give impulses for safe and sustainable development of, of chemicals and materials. And, and one part of this story is to have early warning systems about risks together with TNL, uh, with IOVM in, in Netherlands. Uh, we develop uh, uh, this early for ATMA. This is an early warning system uh, with criteria uh, which are directed to nanomaterials, for example. On the other hand, we want to influence those who develop chemicals, materials and products to, to, to set them up in a way, to develop them in a way that they are safe to use. And, and they will distinguish between three categories or three strategies. The first idea is direct safe to use. That means that we use chemicals, materials which are well tested and which pose a low risk. Uh, so we may call it non-hazard or low hazardous chemicals and materials. But in many cases, I'm looking at, and at the biocides uh, scene, uh, it's not, uh, we cannot avoid hazardous properties. And, and so it, it, there is a strategy to design chemicals, materials and products in a way that exposure is low. And, and if both strategies fail, there is a third way to design procedures for handling in a way uh, that there is a low risk for workers and I think for consumers in, 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 in another, on, an, on the other hand too. This safe to use is not easy because uh, we always talk about no exposure, but, but we know in reality as uh, specialists in occupational safety and health that no exposure is often impossible. So, so we have to, to deal with low risk. And what means low risk? Uh, low risk means that, that risks are minimized to a level which is broadly acceptable by the society. And that this may be, we have such a system in Germany, this may be health-based, OALs based on a toxicological threshold, or in the, in the case of carcinogens, uh, a threshold which depends on a generic risk assess, uh, acceptance. This is, this is one uh, important condition. On the other hand, another important condition is that is, uh, yeah, leads to Paracelsius. Uh, everything is 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 uh, maybe a poison if if the exposure is high. So so it's important even if we have 
such safe to use solution to keep the minimum standards of a good working practices uh, which are laid down in, in, in Germany uh, in, in a technical rule. But speaking in the control banding schemes, it's called control strategy one that means good industrial practice uh, and, and uh, with uh, corresponding measures. I give you I give you examples for direct safety use from our research. Uh, what we surprisingly found some years ago uh, was that not all carbon fibers split into granular particles. Uh, the speaker before me just talked about something about particles. Particles are a threat to workers' health, but a much bigger threat to workers' health are fibers. If they are behave like asbestos after being inhaled into the deep lung. And we find that there are carbon fibers, as well, a type of pitch based carbon fibers, which split into asbestos like fractures. Uh, and, and then we make a project uh, called Cabo Break to, to, to investigate which types of carbon uh, fibers are affected by this splitting into 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 fibers, and we found that is that there are crystalline types, and and with a high density about uh, 1.95, uh, which are they are seldomly used. They are only five percent of the of the whole market. But the problem is, if these fibers come into workplaces, we have very high concentrations of uh, of uh, critical fibers, and this is very important for safe to use problems to not to use this type of fibers in these applications. Looking at integrated safe to use, low emission forms, we have a definition for this in our technical rules. That means we can use granulates, tablets, coating, and so on. Uh, we just currently work together with TNO, uh, making a, a like a map of uh, possibilities for low emission uses and processes. Uh, it's uh, a running project, very interesting, uh, and we hope to uh, present the results in the next years. Uh, and, and the last way is supported safe to use. Uh, that, that means that those who place a chemical which is hazardous on the market, must do more uh, than only uh, providing a classification, a labeling, and a safety data sheet. And, and then we have two strategies. One strategy is, uh, I think it's, it's a good example uh, from industry, refractory ceramic fibers classified as carcinogens, uh, and uh, the ECFIA, that is, is, is the uh, industry association for, for refractory uh, ceramic fibers, has a towards the program carrying out measurements uh, at the application of, of their products, helps them to minimize exposure, and they have a lot of publication, and they were successful to minimize exposure to a level so that these problems uh, products can be used in a way where no other, uh, well, all other, other products fail because of very high temperatures, for, for example. This works because there are only a few players in the field. There's only two firms who produce these fibers and there's already a, 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 a limited number of, of, of uh, firms buying those fibers. This is not the case in the second case of the diisocyanides, uh, where we have uh, many producers and many uh, uh, applications and, and there we have a reach regulation that this was our idea and it is now successfully implemented uh, that that all th uh, those firms who put diisocyanides on the market have to uh, offer training uh, materials and and those firms who want to apply diisocyanides have to uh, to make those available to the workers and have to train them uh, with regard to the safe use of diisocyanide. This is that's our two cases, uh, and we may call it soft and hard regulation. Uh, that is a term often used for this. So, how can we determine uh, 
uh, safe to use solutions. Uh, we have for many years we have the control banding machine adapted from uh, UK HSE uh, as our EMKG easy to, uh, to use workplace control scheme uh, and you can use this because uh, you can you can carry it out for uh, exposure by inhalation, thermal exposure and fire and explosion risk. And if in all cases you come to control strategy one, you have a direct or integrated safe to use case. On the other hand, that is another part of, of our research activities. We have the substitution portal Subsport Plus, where we offer a lot of practical solution and background information on substitution of hazardous chemicals. My last words are about perspectives of our research. Uh, the GRC uh, the, um, has just published uh, a concept for safe and sustainable by design of chemicals and materials, and we are very happy that occupational safety and health play an important role in this in this uh, in this uh, concept, but uh, we are looking a little bit critical on the on the idea that substances of very high concern with regard to the reach regulation uh, cannot be sustainable. Uh, because uh, looking at the next slide, there's also uh, the discussion. And it's also labeled with sustainability on critical raw materials, just uh, with high pressure because of the Ukrainian war uh, and, and and circular economy. So, so looking at at those materials which are regarded in the European Union as critical raw materials, we see that some of them are substances of very high concern under the under the reach regulation and and, and this should work together uh, on the looking at the at the next slide uh, we know that for energy transition e mobility we need uh, we need batteries large batteries and and looking at at a, at a battery for a common small electric car uh, we have about 12 kilograms of cobalt, for example. Yeah. But cobalt is a carcinogenic uh, substance with very high concern. <laughs> yeah, and 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 this is uh, important for occupational safety and health because this is a challenge because the Green Deal will force explosion, exploration, and extraction of those strategic raw materials in the European Union. And, and some of them are substances of very high concern. Uh, the Green Deal should extend the life service and reparability of products, new working places, which all deal with hazardous substances, recovery of secondary raw materials at the end of the life cycle, again, hazardous substances, energy saving redesign of the production of chemicals, e.g. by, by using biological processes. So we have chemical substances and biological agents at the workplace and a decentralized production, e.g. for example, 3D printing or additive manufacturing. So, so we will in, in the next year have a lot of new jobs in a green economy uh, and these jobs should be safe and sustainable in terms of occupation, safety and health from the beginning and not uh, looking after five years, oh, there's a problem in occupation, safety and health. We have a lot of examples on this and, and this doesn't work. So it's very essential from our point of view and we work, we work on this in, in our further research to have safe to use solutions for circularity with substance of concern. Uh, and on the other hand, what is also important to have risk information on those substances of concern along the whole life cycle. And that means uh, we have for uh, 
watches going back, for example, to 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 recycling. We have no safety data sheet or so. So so the current discussion on a digital product passport, from my point of view, is very important for occupational safety and health and for function, functioning of occupational safety and health regulation. This is what I want to present to you. Uh, and yeah, if you have questions, I'm here to answer it. Then, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rolf. That is a lovely picture of you, the last one. <laughs> and uh, thank you for this uh, fantastic pre presentation. You, you provided us with a wealth of ideas to think of safe and sustainable design specifically in uh, the production of chemicals and the use of chemicals. Um, I, I love this last remark you made about a digital product data sheet eh, for chemicals. I remember we had the paper chemical safety data sheet and uh, this should be changed. Uh, pro probably it has been changed already, uh, but we should uh, innovate in that area. Um, I have one question before we go on uh, swiftly to the next speaker. We are a bit over time. I was wondering, we have so many chemical producers in Europe, in Germany, uh, Switzerland. Um, what about the willingness amongst these producers, apart from the regulation that we have, of course, what about their motivation, their willingness really to think of safe and sustainable design? Can you say a few words on that, uh, Rolf? Yes, I can, because I got uh, get a lot of emails. I receive a lot of emails every day from our industry association. And and uh, just today I uh, got uh, uh, the um, an invitation to a conference of the chemical association in, 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 in Germany. And what I see is, is, is a big shift a big shift to the topics of sustainability, of safety by design and so forth. It plays a very important role. Everyone in, in industry is discussing about, about the future of chemical products and chemical industry. That is what I noticed and it, it, it's, I think uh, that the Green Deal has a big impact uh, on, 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 on our society and on our industry. OK, that's great to hear. So you, you see sort of raising awareness amongst these producers really to produce in a safe and sustainable way, although they are working with chemicals and um, several composition of chemicals. Yeah. Thank you very much again, uh, Rolf. Uh, I think there was a question, but we will go on to the next speaker and then um, see uh, if uh, we can also answer these questions all together. Um, there is uh, one question has arrived also for Eve. So Eve, please stay uh, online for a while. Uh, you have to give an answer. And uh, we will go to our next speaker, who is Steen Mollerup from STAMI, which is the Norwegian Institute on Occupational Safety and Health Research. And Steen um, is a research professor, toxicologist at STAMI. Um, his main interests are toxic mechanisms of chemicals in the work environment and um, diesel exhaust is one of his uh, specialities and air pollution particulates. Mollerup uh, Sostein acts as a coordinator of STAMI's multiple activities in the PARC program and he will give us a presentation about the PARC program. Um, he participates in PARC projects related to occupational biomonitoring hazard identification of natural toxins and development of next generation risk assessment tools. And Steen is also a member of STAMI's advisory regulatory toxicology expert group. I think that is an advisory group for the Norwegian government, I guess, Steen. Yeah, yeah. he's nodding yes. So um, we have quite a very good expert here, toxicologist. Steen, the floor is yours, please share your uh, experience your findings about PARC project with us. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me. Uh, is my slide shown? Yeah, yeah, super. So um, yes, I'm here today to present the PARC, PARC project, which some of you may have heard of before but um, anyway um, and I'm going to present a review of, of STAMI and hopefully uh, of occupational safety and health um, and 
what I am presenting is not the views of uh, is the views of an affiliated partner, and we are not part of any official ARC entities, so we are not in in the management or, or anything. So yes, so what is PARC? Uh, and why PARC? Uh, PARC is num PARC in numbers, organization of the partnership and occupational safety and health in PARC, including Stamish activities, is what I'm going to, to talk about. Uh, PARC is an EU-wide research and innovation partnership program. It deals not only with occupational safety and health, but with the whole chemical area. It builds on the Human by Monitoring for EU program, which some of you may know about. Um, it was a recent large Human by Monitoring program with partners from many uh, European countries, but uh, part PARC is much uh, larger and, and, and a much broader program. This means that, uh, yeah, um, the aim is to support uh, EU and national chemical risk assessment and risk management bodies with new data, knowledge, methods, networks, and skills to address current emerging and novel chemical safety challenges to protect human health and the environment. So very high aims. Um, there are three objectives in PARC. The first is to establish an EU-wide sustainable cross-disciplinarity network to identify and agree on research and innovation needs and to support research uptake into regulatory chemical risk assessment. The second is to carry out joint EU research and innovation activities responding to identified priorities in support of current regulatory risk assessment processes for chemical substances and to emerging challenges. And lastly, strengthening existing capacities and building new transdisciplinary platforms to support chemical risk assessment of next generation. So in all this means that PARC is meant to support and strengthen current chemical regulatory toxicology and make ready to meet new challenges in the form of new chemical substances of concern and new uh, risk assessment methods. Um, so like uh, Rolf talked about uh, in the previous presentation, um, ARC also uh, complies with the EU Commission priorities of uh, EU chemicals strategy for sustainability, where the, it is uh, meant to work towards a toxic free environment and also the European Green Deal with the Zero Pollution Action Plan. Um, why do we need PARC? Well, there is a need for better evidence-based methods for the assessment of risk from chemicals. There's an incomplete occurrence and exposure data. Occupational hazard and risk assessment currently rely primarily on epidemiological and animal data. This is costly and time consuming. Uh, and it has to be said that in vitro studies may support on toxic mechanisms, um, but those cannot be directly uh, used to, to, to set uh, exposure limits uh, and, and do the risk assessment. There's a pressure to reduce animal studies, the three R's. Uh, that is due to ethical reasons, but actually an, another important reason is the low precision of animal studies for uh, human health impact. There's a huge number and diversity of chemicals out there, as you see on the, the figure on the right. Um, and uh, within the occupational safety and health, approximately 300, 700 OELs are out there. Uh, that is Norwegian numbers, I think, maybe. I don't know the numbers for, for the rest of Europe, but I, I would guess it would be in of similar uh, magnitude. There are gaps in toxicology that needs to be filled uh, uh, to uh, do risk assessment for many of those chemicals. And thus there is a need for higher throughput risk assessment with human relevance and with high precision. So ARC is an EU Horizon Europe uh, partnership. There are 28 countries participating in the program. There are 200 partners. Actually, I think the last number I saw was 201, 202. 
Um, also on board are the EU agencies ECA, EFSA and EEA. The time frame is from 2022 to 2029, so seven years, and uh, the uh, program started officially on the 1st of May uh, this year. It is co-funded between the EU Horizon Europe and the participating partners, each contribu contributing with 50%. Uh, so the program has a total budget of 400 million euros. From, and, and from the EU, uh, there will then be 200 million. The park strategy is to fill knowledge gaps within chemical risk assessment to provide support to authorities regarding new evidence-based methods, NAMs, AOPs and YARAs. And on the bottom right, you have a small explanation of uh, what an IADA is. It's an integrated approach to testing and assessment. Um, the PARC program is a cross-disciplinary and broad program. It, as I mentioned, it includes not only occupational safety and health, but also public health, food, pharmacy, consumer products, water and the environment. And, maybe all other things all in addition. Um, the goal is to come to a one substance, one assessment, and that uh, is to be done by using common evidence, tools and methods. Um, <clears throat> another part of the strategy is to build strong networks. That is within scientific community, but also regulatory community <clears throat> and regarding training and education. And, and all of it, this goes across Europe and across sectors. PARC is uh, organized into nine work packages. We have the BP1, which deals with management and coordination. I will not speak much of that. And then we have the BP2, a common science policy agenda, BP3, synergies, collaboration and awareness. And on the bottom, we see the VP7 fair data work package, and VP8 concepts and toolboxes, and VP9 capacities. And then in the middle, we have the central work packages, where work package four is dealing with monitoring and exposure, um, looking at human by monitoring, uh, also environmental, and, and innovative methods and tools for monitoring and surveys. And on the right hand side, we have the VP5, the hazard assessment uh, work package, where we, it is, there is going to be toxicity testing addressing data gaps of concern. And uh, there's also going to be work with innovative methods and tools for toxicity testing and modeling. And then in the middle, we have the VP6 that would, uh, that will uh, feed on uh, results from VP4 and VP5. And, and we'll work on innovation in regulatory risk assessment um, using integrated approaches to testing and assessment, uh, and also integrated exposure and risk assessment, reviewing of risk assessment methodologies and tra transposing results to regulatory risk assessment uh, methodologies. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, have a little look at, at uh, some of the work packages uh, to to uh, give some point of interest for the occupational safety and health perspective. Um, so in, in work package two, uh, um, the goal is to establish a cross-disciplinary network to set priorities, uh, knowledge management and uptake into policy, very important and sustainability. Um, there is a couple of sub goals here, the Parkopedia, which is Park's knowledge management platform that will uh, take care of all the knowledge acquired by the partnership. And then there's the Park Root uh, subtask, which will develop, develop uh, the implementation of a series of strategy roadmaps in order to actually promote the uptake of the innovative science developed in Park into regulatory risk assessment practice. And there is a project where Stami is taking part on the NGRA route, a roadmap for actually promoting the paradigm shift towards implementing NGRA in major chemical regulation programs. 
And Stami's role there is to ensure the occupational safety and health representation and to draw the occupational regulatory map. MVP3, dealing with synergies, collaboration and awareness. Uh, there is to be established a, a stakeholder forum. Uh, Stami is uh, working on that and has uh, invited occupational safety and health candidates. So maybe some of the listeners have been uh, contacted there. Um, a, a list of suggested stakeholders has now been sent to the management board and, and will go on to the governing board and will be finally decided on before uh, the end of this year. Um, Sam is also involved in the establishment of the international board where candidates are being con contacted and this has to be appointed in the beginning of 2023. Um, and then there's a communication dissemination and awareness part um, in VP3 uh, where the, it is uh, meant to have a centralized communication framework including both internal and external communication rules and guidelines, capacity, building events such as training, conferences, webinars, workshops, as well as dissemination through uh, the park website and uh, social media. So in Work Package 4, we are doing uh, human by monitoring. STAMI is involved in the uh, subtask design, alignment and field work of human by monitoring studies, including occupational surveys. Uh, we are involved in a human by monitoring survey in the waste management sector and in connection to what we also talked about before, uh, we are going to look at e-waste, uh, including car batteries and also plastics, uh, plastics from the household and from the industry. The study will comprise 50 workers and 25 controls in each of 12 countries, so 900 samples in total. And uh, for now, it is uh, agreed to uh, study metals, frame, flame retardants and phthalates. Um, and on the bottom, we have in, in uh, the uh, subtask with innovative methods and tools for monitoring and surveys. Here is STAMI on the uh, uh, suspect screening approaches um, subtask, where we are going to work with innovative sampling and HRS and EDA screening methods for exploring ex occupational exposure. And in particular, we are interested in wristband sampling. Um, so in Work Package 5, which was an on a hazard assessment, we are in uh, uh, our, uh, the task of toxicity testing, addressing gaps of concern, <coughs> where the goal is to close data gaps of concern for human health and the environment using OECD tests, but also other tests. Uh, there is a project on natural toxins, uh, which are the iniotins and alternaria toxins in this case. And there's another one on BPA alternatives. And STAMI is uh, doing an immunotoxicity study on alternaria toxins, including receptor report assays and air liquid uh, interface exposure of a 3D in vitro model of human bronchial epithelium, followed by transcriptomics and, and pathway analysis. And in this uh, web page, there's also innovative methods and tools for toxicity testing and modeling and quantitative systems toxicology and development of new AOPs. So in VP6, which is a large uh, work package and where STAMI is taking part in many uh, projects, uh, I think I will go right to the projects. Uh, uh, we are in, in the subtask delivering IATAS for selected set of human effects. We are working on case studies on genotoxicity, specific target organ toxicity. Here we work with liver fry process and possibly also lung fibrosis. Uh, there's a case study on endocrine disruption and one on human relevance assessment. And then we are on the projects uh, in, the, in the subtask integrative exposure and risk assessment on aggregate exposure from multiple sources and routes for general population and workers, mixed air exposure and risk assessment, human health impact assessment and risk indicators. 
And under the review of risk assessment methodology, we are also taking part in four uh, case studies, one on workplace risk assessment, one of uh, effectiveness of risk assessment for reducing risk, one of guidance values for occupational exposures to reproductive and developmental toxins, and one on skin sensitization and risk assessment. Steen, uh, sorry to interrupt. We are yeah. running a bit short in time, so uh, yeah. if you can wrap up, that would be yeah. fantastic. Yeah, super. Okay. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah, the, the last one is maybe not so important, so uh, I can take uh, this slide, we can skip it because we are not part there. And uh, Rolf, Rolf uh, talk a little about fair data. And uh, say, uh, no, we talk about safe and sustainable and design. Uh, so um, in, in this web package nine, I can say overall that we are also involved in laboratory networking, building exposure monitoring capacities, joint activities and harmonization and in training. Um, so what makes Park unique and new? This is important, of course. Um, the chances for Park is that regulatory, regulatory authorities are actively participating in this project. They are, so to speak, in the driver's seat. Risk assessors and managers are on board, and there's an explicit focus on new methods, arms and next generation risk assessment. And there's a strategic focus on regulatory need and impl implementation. So. The goal is to lay the ground for a paradigm shift, going from traditional uh, risk assessment uh, onto uh, generation risk assessment methodology. The chances, of course, are that there are many unsolved scientific questions. Uh, the uh, toxicity data needed to to make uh, AOPs and and uh, IATAs are, for a large part, lacking. There are hundreds of different projects in park. That means that there is a need for strategic uh, alignment. Uh, you need to have all partners, all project uh, members to, to look in the same direction. Um, and there is a need to engage the regulatory and policy making communities. Now we are approaching the end. I think we can skip this one. Um, yeah, of course, the best possible outcome of PARC is if we at some time can say staying safe from chemicals is like a walk in the park. And so thank you for your attention. OK, thank you, Steen. That is really a huge project, what you were describing with a huge budget as well. And I think uh, indeed Stami is uh, heavily involved. I think the coordinator is from France, if I'm That's correct. true, uh, ANSES. Yes, yeah. and ANSES Pascal indeed. Sanders. And we have a few Proche uh, uh, member institutes also in in this consortium. So I think it would be great to um, report again on the on the first results eh, of all these projects and activities after one or two years, because I think that mm. the project has just started, if I'm uh, yeah. correct. So, um, OK, given the time, um, first of all, thank you very much to all three speakers. Um, I would like to, to stick to the time a bit. We will have a look at, I think, two questions two that questions we received. We have, indeed. And I think it's one for Eve and one for Rolf. Yes, Am I correct. correct. Yes. No. Uh, the first question, Eve, is for you. Um, as this is a cross sectional uh, study, really? Claudia Drossard from Bawa, she is wondering if you have any information on the duration of the employment uh, or selection bias. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I don't understand all the, all the question because uh, uh, the sound cut. Let me repeat. Uh, she asks, uh, do you have any information on duration of employment slash selection bias? Uh, employment, I don't understand the word after. Selection bias, so the duration oh, of employment. Sorry. I guess uh, how long is someone working in such an environment with exposure to metal working fluids and is there some sort of selection bias there because the longer they work the more they are exposed i guess this yeah we cannot ask for clarification of the question but I yes think this yes is of course yes, of, of course yeah. yes but the sounds sometimes uh, is Break not sound good sound. sorry um uh, what can i say yes um so we take into account the, the duration of exposure in the analysis uh, I didn't show that, but we, we have the results for this. 
and um, uh, you have to 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 know that um, we study uh, biomarkers um, biomarkers of oxidative stress are short, uh, have short term effect short term effects, and uh, we studied the evolution do, during the two phase according to exposure. Just so. Um, uh, um, the time worked before didn't um, uh, we didn't take it into account because we just studied the evolution of uh, the concentration of the biomarkers between the two days. Yes, and uh, for the other time for the other parameter, we take into account the duration of exposure. And if there a selection bias, um, of, I don't think so. Um, I have to think about it. <laughs> so yeah. then we, we would say it's a very good question. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Maybe maybe you can do it in such a way, Yves. Um, uh, it is a colleague uh, from us from Bawa, from Germany. And okay. uh, if okay, you are still yes. watching, she can of, of course approach you. Uh, by yes. email and for further yes. clarification yes. of this. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. no problem. Okay, okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Eve. Yeah. Okay, I hope the sound is well. Uh, the next question for Rolf uh, from Jeroen Ter Woerd. Um, he finds the F2484 uh, project on low emission solution very interesting. Um, and he was wondering when will something be published? Yes, thank you for this question. Uh, I don't have an overview over our project, but I think uh, uh, it's it's a two step uh, project. The first step is to collect solutions and the step second step of the project is to carry out measurement about the reduction potential for exposure uh, on selected chemicals uh, for uh, for some uh, identified specific solutions. That's, 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 a, that's the current current idea of the project. And so I think the project will run two more years, uh, but I'm not aware if, if there will be a publication in uh, uh, before ending uh, the second part of the project. Okay. I will ask and then you may uh, send me an email and I will uh, okay. Ask the question to, okay, to the colleagues time. who carry out this project. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Jeroen, uh, Jeroen Te Woord, former colleague of mine from TNO. <laughs> <laughs> if you are watching, you are probably still watching, you can send an email to Rolf uh, Pakarov and uh, to remind him, uh, please inform me when this publication is, uh, is ready or will be uh, published. Okay, then we have come to the end of our webinar. I would like to thank Eve, Steen and Rolf very much for your contributions. This always takes some preparation. Uh, you did a great job and I think we had a really nice uh, webinar on chemical projects and research uh, in Paroche. Uh, thank you again and uh, Joyce, thank you for uh, <laughs> moderating the, the, the chat with a few questions we had. And I would like to say to everyone who is watching, thank you for participating. Uh, have a look at our website. Uh, you can subscribe again to our newsletter and events like this one. And um, in a few weeks, we will publish the video of this uh, webinar on our website and on YouTube. So you can um, have a look at it or disseminate it to others who are interested. Thanks again. And uh, thanks for the technical staff who uh, solved a lot of solutions. And we'll be back uh, next month with a new webinar and we will publish the information on this webinar soon. Thanks a lot and enjoy your evening and weekend uh, and see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.